Iran are a major threat to the safety and security of their own people and to the rest of the world. It is vitally important to the national security of the United States and its allies to persuade the Iranian re regime to end its quest for nuclear weapons and to end its support for terrorism. Since 1995, our nation has attempted to do that by banning United States companies from doing any business in Iran. In 1996, the Iran Sanctions Act provided for sanctions against foreign firms that invest in Iran's energy sector. It was revealed earlier this year that the federal government has awarded more than $100 billion in contracts, payments, grants, and other benefits over the past 10 years to the foreign and multinational American companies while they were doing business in Iran. So not only are some companies doing business in Iran, but they are also getting government contracts at the same time. Obviously, federal agencies all need to get onto the same page. Earlier this month, Congress acted to strengthen the economic sanctions against Iran, recognizing that banking is the lifeblood of international trade. The comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Divestment Act imposes tough new restrictions on banks and insurance companies. It also requires federal contractors to certify that they are not doing business with Iran. However, for United States sanctions to be successfully, they must be fully implemented and enforced. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses about how they intend to do that. I particularly want to thank the State Department and the Treasury Department for agreeing to testify today's, at today's hearing. I understand that both agencies are in the process of investigating companies that may be doing business with Iran. We certainly don't want to compromise ongoing investigations. And in that regard, I am going to ask the members to be judicious in their questions. Sanctions cannot just be a cat and mouse game where the government tries to chase after companies who are evading sanctions and undermining global security in the name of profit. Companies, especially those doing business with the government, need to take responsibility and avoid supporting the Iranian regime. With each passing week, as Iran moves closer, to developing nuclear weapons, the stakes are raised higher and higher and higher. Today, I look forward to hearing how we can ensure that economic sanctions are effectively implemented. I uh, now yield five minutes to the gen ranking member, uh, the gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Chairman Towns, and thank you so much for holding yet another hearing on this important subject. When we began as a body trying to figure out what to do with the religious-based extreme takeover, it was 1979. I was an Army lieutenant. The world was a very different place 31 years ago. So although, for the most part, today we will be talking about sanctions, whether the President's outreach hand has been good or bad toward dissuading Iran on its nuclear ambitions. It is very clear to all of us who today have graying hair and 31 years ago were comparatively young, comparatively fit, and ready to bomb the hell out of Iran in order to get them to release our embassy people that they had taken in violation of international law, protocol, and any sense of common decency. Mr. Chairman, nothing has changed in 31 years, or has it? 31 years ago, as the Ayatollah took over and, quote, a sleight of hand caused radical students to take our embassy, not the government. We all looked and said, how do we resolve this? Well-meaning people, bipartisan uh, and bicameral parts of Congress, looked to try to find a way to work out a diplomatic solution. Day after day after day, 
throughout all the waning days of the Carter administration, people of good faith and good will tried to do the right thing without violence and to no avail. Mr. Chairman, only the coming of a President willing to do anything necessary to end the humiliation for the American people and this violation of world protocol brought an end to it. <clears throat> I look forward today to hearing how actual sanctions with greater teeth passed on a bipartisan basis in this Congress are working. I look forward to a day in which not only will we be talking about Iran giving up its uh, ambitions for nuclear weapons, a day in which Iran will realize that those sanctions will not just be lifted if they, quote, stop trying to develop a nuke, but they also abandon their expansionist views of a Shia greater state that goes from the Mediterranean to who knows where. Mr. Chairman, this is about an organization that began on a lie, has continued a lie, and has transitioned over these many decades. At one time, people thought it was a theocracy. I think people who have looked at Iran in more detail realize that over time, all parts of government have become, to a greater extent, controlled by the Revolutionary Guard, by people who come up through a very limited, very exclusive military background. That's how you move ahead in Iran. But at the same time, there is a religious vein. It is a vein of radical Islam, one that is willing to see people killed or kidnapped in Lebanon as early as the 1980s, one that continues to fund death and a lack of peace in the Middle East, particularly in the Levant. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to all of the good that can be done by this sanction. I look forward to hearing that it's working at last. But until or unless we can truly say we look forward to a day in which Iran becomes a part of the nations that obey all of the rules, including not exporting terrorism, not funding over overthrow of, of peaceful governments, we will not have an Iran we can truly work with. I'm not an extremist. I'm not a person who wants to use weapons. But if the only weapon we have doesn't work, America will eventually have no choice but to use alternate means in order to prevent nuclear holocaust. With that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the hearing and yield back. I thank the gentleman um, for his statement. Let me just indicate that we are going to have two uh, opening statements on each side at three minutes. So um, uh, um, you will select in terms of the two on your side. I now yield uh, three minutes to the gentlewoman from uh, New York. Congresswoman Maloney. Thank you, Chairman uh, Towns, uh, for your leadership on this issue and for having this very important and timely hearing. Iran is on a fast path towards achieving nuclear weapons capability. And Iran, a, nu and, and Iran, a nuclear weapon would likely spell the end of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. If Iran acquires such a capability, nuclear weapons could spread throughout the region. As Iran's nuclear capabilities have increased in the last few years, more than a dozen Arab states have discovered a newfound interest in peaceful nuclear energy. And if nuclear capabilities proliferate in the Middle East, they will spread across the world. The chances for nuclear technology to fall into the hands of terrorists will rise, and we will all live in a much more dangerous world. It is not uh, just the United States that thinks so. Five United Nations Security Council resolutions have mandated that Iran stop all its nuclear enrichment and reprocessing activities. And yet Iran has yet to heed the calls of the international community. Its brutal repression of the Iranian people continues unabated. Millions of Iranians rose up against a stolen election last summer, electrifying the, rule, the, the entire world. It was inspiring. And according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, Iran has already stockpiled enough low enriched uranium that if further enriched, it would be uh, enough for um, the, the cores of two nuclear weapons. 
Uh, so this is uh, very, very troubling and, and, and it underscores the importance of the hearing. Despite the efforts of President Obama to reach out to the Iranian government and to engage it diplomatically over the course of the last 18 months, the regimes in Tehran continue to spurn our efforts and that of our allies. Uh, that is why the United Nations Security Council adopted more stringent sanctions on Iran this past June. It is why the European Union announced this week the strongest set of sanctions on Iran it has ever proposed. It is why President Obama announced stepped-up U.S. sanctions, and it is most assuredly why Congress overwhelmingly last month passed the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Divestment Act. I strongly believe that if fully implemented, this legislation in combination with the new multilateral efforts pre presents perhaps the best last hope of changing Iran's nuclear ambitions through diplomatic, economic, and political activity. I'd like to remind the committee that this is the fourth law that has been enacted over the past 14 years that imposes sanctions against Iran. We must ensure that it is the one that we finally will make the difference and once and for all uh, squash this enrichment activity. I see that my time is uh, up, but I have a great deal more to say. I ask a unanimous consent to place my entire statement into the record. Without objection, so ordered. I now yield to the gentleman from Indiana, Congressman Brayton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For three uh, minutes. I was one of the conferees on the uh, Iran sanctions bill, and uh, I am not optimistic that it's going to work. But I would like to refer to some things that my predecessor, the young lady, just uh, mentioned. Uh, there have been three uh, moves to try to control or get Iran to stop its nuclear pro uh, program. In 1995, on March 15th, President Clinton signed an executive order. A subsequent order was on May 8, 1995, uh, and that banned virtually all trade with Iran. And Warren Christopher warned the international community that the path Iran was on the following was following the mirror image of sta states taken by other nations that sought nuclear weapons capabilities. And then in 1996, uh, Congress uh, passed the Iran and Libya Sanctions Act, and uh, that was to encourage foreign persons to withdraw from the uh, Iranian market, and it also uh, was supposed to impose sanctions on any foreign entity that invested $20 million or more in Iran's energy sector. Now, the reason I bring that up is because we passed uh, what I thought was a very, very strong bill. And I thought it was going to have, uh, in conjunction with the EU and others, I thought it was going to have a, a, a pretty strong impact on Iran. But it gave the president waiver authority. And that bothers me a great deal because this $20 million penalty that was supposed to be imposed in 1996 has never been imposed on anybody. So whether you're a Republican president or Democrat president, whatever it is, these, these penalties have not been imposed, and we've given waiver authority to the president once again. And so uh, the one thing I'd like to say today, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member, is that we ought to do everything we can to make absolutely sure that the sanctions are followed through and there is no waiver. The reports that are required from the president should be complete and they should make sure that no waivers have been granted. If we don't do that, in my opinion, I think we are on the precipice of a war which could threaten the economy of the United States, not just the Middle East, but the economy of the United States because we get about 30 to 40 percent of our energy from that part of the world, and we certainly are not even close to energy independence. And with that, I'll yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from Indiana for a statement, and now you yield three minutes to the uh, gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as uh, some of you know, I voted against uh, H.R. 2194, the sanctions bill. I oppose it because I think that these sanctions will inflict economic hardship on the Iranian people and have no impact on the Iranian government. As a matter of fact, they'll probably strengthen the Iranian government, which relies on confrontation. And instead of working to uh, build a pro-democracy movement by taking care not to have sanctions that are inevitably going to hurt the people of Iran, we're doing exactly the opposite. And if there's anyone in this room who thinks that the United States can afford still another war with troops 
in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. If there's anyone who thinks we can afford another war, then maybe you don't need to be in this discussion. But what we ought to be looking for is a more effective means of engaging Iran uh, and continue to work behind the scenes to try to uh, bring I Iran to uh, the table. Uh, this is not an easy issue, granted. But the uh, easy reach that, uh, that some inside the government, and I'm not speaking about this committee, some inside the government have to, uh, uh, to seek to escalate, very dangerous, quite dangerous. And I, I think that uh, we should be thinking more about how you promote democracy without uh, making, uh, creating sanctions which are going to undermine uh, the very people who we say we care about. Uh, you know, I opposed nuclear proliferation for military purposes for all countries. At the same time, I think it's pretty clear that sanctions have proven to be a failed policy. I've argued that the sanctions included in the legislation play into the hands of the leaders in Iran, undermine the efforts of Iranian people who have courageously challenged their government, often at the cost of their lives. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, as we get into this discussion today and down the road, uh, that we'll look at, at the situation as it is, at what happens when you try to use sanctions as, a, as an excuse for diplomacy, and what happens when we get off the diplomatic track and start to move towards uh, escalation. We cannot have military escalation. Matter of fact, I, I want to ask the unanimous consent to submit for the record a recent comment by uh, by Admiral Mike uh, Mullen, who um, advised against an attack on, uh, on Iran. That objection so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that note, uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for three minutes. Thank you. I think that today we need to acknowledge the fact that we have a very fragile political situation in the Middle East and that Iran is a major portion of that problem. Um, I think the ranking member made, uh, alluded to the situation that has been brewing there for many, many years. This isn't a new situation, uh, but now it's continued to grow and fester to the point where uh, we need to acknowledge what's going on and need to take some action. Uh, the first thing that needs to happen is that we as a country and the president himself needs to acknowledge that terrorism exists. These people are in, that are they're there are wanting to do us harm. Many Americans, Mr. Chairman, believe that uh, the president doesn't understand the threat and he's ill prepared to meet it. According to surveys, many 57 percent of Democrats, 59 percent of independents, 80 percent of Republicans think the president has been tough enough, has not been tough enough on Iran. Meanwhile, the president's reticence to support popular opposition to the Ahmadinejad regime has extracted an incalculable cost to our strategic efforts and the nation's moral standing. Indeed, President Obama's general approach to Iran seems to be based on the absurd belief that the Iranian nuclear program has been encouraged by American belligerence and American diplomatic intransigency. In response, President Obama has offered a course of conciliation and supplication. This response is beyond naive. It's very dangerous. I think it's also important to note that going forward, uh, the fact that we are here today discussing, discussing sanctions would seem to uh, indicate that it's a tacit acknowledgement that the past uh, pro program and protocol of holding hands and the approach of uh, trying to be friends with these people at the expense of our friend Israel, an ally there in the Middle East, has not worked. I look forward to the uh, discussion and uh, yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for his uh, statement. Uh, and I now ask unanimous consent to leave the record open for seven days so members that may submit their opening remarks and questions for the record. Of course, um, we have uh, two panels today. And um, the first panel, um, uh, we will turn to them now. Mr. Robert J. Einhorn, who is Special Advisor for Nonproliferation and Arms Control with the United States Department of State. Our next witness is Mr. Daniel Glazer, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Terrorists financing and financial crimes at the United States Department of Treasury. The next witness is Mr. Joseph A. Neurotter, uh, Deputy Associate Administrator with the Office of Acquisition Policy 
at the United States General Services Administration. Our final, final witness in this panel is Mr. Joseph A. Kristoff, who is the Director of International Affairs and Trade at the United States Government Accountability Office. Uh, it is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer. Let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. I will begin with you, uh, Mr. Einhorn, and of course, um, uh, as you know, there's the lights they start off, lights on green. You go down to one minute, and it turns to yellow. And then after that, it turns to red. Now, red means stop. So uh, we appreciate if you would recognize that, and of course, uh, which will allow the, the members to have an opportunity to raise questions with you. So uh, you may begin, and you have five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Towns. Uh, uh, Mr. Issa, members of the uh, committee. Pull thank the mic you. just a little closer to you. Thank, you. thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. A nuclear-armed Iran would severely threaten the security and stability of a part of the world crucial to our interests and to the health of the global economy. In the face of this challenge, American policy is straightforward. We've pursued our broad policy goals through both engagement and pressure. We've sought to sharpen the choice now before the Iranian leadership. Last year, we embarked on an unprecedented effort to engage with Iran. Engagement is both a test of Iran's intentions and an investment in a partnership with a growing coalition of countries deeply concerned about Iran's nuclear ambitions. We've sought and continued to seek opportunities for Iran to demonstrate convincingly that its nuclear program is intended entirely for peaceful purposes. These opportunities have not been embraced by Iran. Iran's intransigence left the international community no choice but to employ a second tool of diplomacy, namely pressure. The adoption of uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1929 was an essential first step in that effort, building upon and strengthening previous sanctions resolutions. It bans transfers of major conventional weapon systems to Iran. It bans all Iranian activities related to ballistic missiles that could deliver a nuclear weapon. It establishes a framework for cargo inspections to detect and stop Iran's smuggling and acquisition of illicit items. It prohibits Iran from in investing abroad in sensitive nuclear activities, such as uranium mining. It creates important new tools to help block Iran's use of the international financial system to fund and facilitate its nuclear and other destabilizing weapons programs. It targets directly the role of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran's proliferation efforts, adding 15 IRGC entities to the list of designees for asset freeze. And for the first time, the Security Council highlighted formally uh, in the Security Council resolution the potential links between Iran's energy sector and its nuclear ambitions. Our goal now is to ensure the most aggressive implementation of these sanctions uh, as possible. We're not alone. The European Union has acted strongly to follow up by endorsing a series of significant steps as have Australia and Canada. We've called on states around the world to take additional measures and will continue to engage with these partners. Our efforts to implement and endorse the multilateral sanctions are supplemented by a number of important national tools, in particular, the Iran Sanctions Act and the recently passed Comprehensive Iran Sanctions, Accountability, and Divestment Act. 
As with the ca was the case with the original San Iran Sanctions Act, the obligations of the new legislation are already a regular part of our dialogue with foreign governments and the private sector. Our efforts have yielded significant results. At least 50 to 60 billion dollars in oil and gas development deals have either been put on hold uh, or, uh, or have been discontinued in the last few years, due in part to our conversations with companies about the threat of ISI sanctions. Our pressure has contributed to the decisions by major international oil companies such as Total, State Oil, ENI, Lucol, and, Rep and Repsol not to undertake any new activities in Iran. In addition, Major fuel suppliers such as VTOL, Shell, Reliance, IPG, Glencore, and Trafigura have announced that they will no longer sell refined petroleum products to Iran. 